Your father is Oliver Stone, the three-time Oscar-winning movie director. As Marilyn Monroe described Hollywood, it's like they'll pay whatever, like $10,000 for a kiss and a, and a penny for your soul. Hollywood, I always said LA was a mental hospital. The government has shown you a track record of nothing but mistruth after mistruth after scandal after conspiracy. <laughs> we were out here basically as like George Floyd saying, I can't breathe. And the liberals are like, yeah, we hate the authority figure when it's the cop, but they love being the authority figure when they're telling you to put the mask on. That is the, the programming. It starts early, right? It's not programming isn't just about like the information they're teaching. It's about how they're training you at an unconscious level. Don't step out the lines. I don't think it's about them surveilling and controlling us. I think it's no, it's actually us surveilling, controlling anyone who tries to be in power. Now you're going to be held accountable. We the people are in charge. All right, guys, welcome back to the Conscious Wealth Podcast. This week, we are joined by Mr. Sean Stone. Sean, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks, man. It's good to see you. Appreciate you being here. So I'm going to read your Wikipedia about me, which I thought was pretty entertaining. And I'm, about sure, you? You, I'm sure you sh share the sentiment. No, it's, it's your about me. Uh, oh. I'm going to read it for the audience to introduce you. And then I'll introduce you in my own words based on uh, the research that I did to prepare for today. So it says Sean Christopher Stone is an American actor, filmmaker and television host. Sean hosted a show on the Russian state funded network RT America until the network was shut down in 2022 after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Stone was born in New York City. He is the son of Elizabeth Cox and film director Oliver Stone, and has appeared in several of his father's films. A convert to Shia Islam in 2012, in an interview with CNN, Stone said that he accepted Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. Stone is a member of the board of advisors of the company Mindshare Ventures Group based in New York City. So before I uh, give my audience a little rundown of, of my own <laughs> intro of you, would you say that that's a uh, accurate or inaccurate depiction of you based on wikipedia well it's certainly limited but there's also two falsehoods in there which is why i always i always point out to people that how flawed wikipedia is um <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't host a show on rt until 2022 when russia invaded ukraine i hosted a show on rt until 2020 hmm. when uh i was basically replaced <laughs> and sort of parted ways yeah with, uh, with with uh, the president at the time of the RT, who actually uh, I think got himself some kind of big trouble by shutting down RT and taking the money, but that's a whole other uh. story. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't born in New York City, so boom, there you go. <laughs> Wikipedia is full of full of nonsense. And yeah, I never go to Wikipedia to to find out anything more than just superficial information, as as you understand. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was a, I thought it was a funny intro because I'm reading this and each, a lot of the lines say unreliable source in parentheses. <laughs> so I'm like, this is probably a, a half true, but I also thought it was, it was funny when it had on there. Oh, sure. So in in my own, uh, in my own research, diving into your background, man, the more I've dove into it, the more fascinated I am at the life you've lived, and I'm excited to have a conversation. We kind of connected just organically, right? I think you followed me one day, and I was like, whoa, who's this guy? And then I started looking at your work and some of the people you were collaborating with. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting. He's doing some big things, but I couldn't really, I couldn't grasp like what angle you were coming at it from, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so I've, <laughs> so I've looked, I've looked more into your background since then. And, um, I'll give my audience kind of the, the high level overview and then, and then I'll let you kind of, you can correct me if I'm wrong on anything and you can introduce yourself if you prefer in a different way. So number one, first thing that I thought was uh, mind blowing is that your father is Oliver Stone, the three time Oscar winning movie director. And for my audience who may not be big into movies like I am, he's directed or worked on directing movies that hopefully you're all aware of, such as Scarface, Natural Born Killers, Any Given Sunday, and the rap sheet goes on. You yourself has have personally acted in Natural Born Killers, Any Given Sunday, JFK, and other movies directed by your father, which is pretty badass. You've written multiple books, including A Century of War, which is all about the military industrial complex. 
you were on CNN 11 years ago being interviewed by Piers Morgan about, about relations with the Middle East. There are Associated Press videos of you about eight years ago, I believe, live from Tehran during the era when we had real tensions with them uh, advocating for peace. You've directed the Meta Human documentary with Deepak Chopra. You also directed the Best Kept Secret documentary all about human trafficking, pedophilia, and Hollywood and the government's connection to that world. You've interviewed Robert Kennedy Jr. on a podcast. And then, as I mentioned, you've had two alternative TV kind of media-based shows. One was called Buzzsaw on Gaia, and the other was called Watching the Hawks that we referenced, uh, which was an RT news show. So that's a hell of a rap sheet, man. Did I, did I uh, get anything incorrect in there? There's, there's three things I'll, 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 uh, I'll clarify. One, um, the book. So Century of War is actually a documentary. The book is New World Order. I think that's what you were okay. thinking of. Um, okay. and, uh, and Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Jr. actually interviewed me on his podcast. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the uh, other stuff is, is correct. I also did a show called Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura. Um, and that was actually re- pretty much my gateway into doing uh, programs like Buzzsaw and uh, watching the Hawks for RT. Um, you know, currently I just do like interviews on on uh, this platform called BU TV. But um, really, that was my gateway. Um, after I did my feature film, my first feature film was called uh, Greystone Park, which is based on my experiences breaking into like haunted mental hospitals in uh, New York City. <laughs> And uh, we made a movie about, about, you know, one of them called Greystone. And uh, yeah, so that's like a little bit more, just uh, a little bit more fleshed out. Cool, cool. So obviously when I, when I read a, a rap sheet like that, I, I definitely want to start with how did, how did this all get started? Like usually the type of people I'm connecting with and collaborating with are usually coming from the online space of leveraging social media and and building some sort of brand or business. And that's how I eventually come into their awareness. You have a very different story of, and background as well. Um, So I'm very curious, like how did this get started for you and how did you get to a place of rubbing shoulders with these kinds of people? Well, you you said it yourself. I mean, (laughs) I grew up, you know, uh, with my father on his, you know, on film sets and, you know, acting in films and, I've always been very much uh, attracted to, in love with film, cinema, and then more importantly, like recognizing the power of media as a whole, right? And so film is one aspect of it, but media transcends, right? Media is, this is media, uh, news programs are media, music is media, um, this sort of vast, but, but for the most part being, for myself being very interested by the narratives, like the mainstream narratives that are being put out and um, I guess since, you know, since I was a kid, I was very much because I traveled with my dad, because I got to see the world, because I was reading and studying history and seeing things from a different perspective. I was very much interested in iconoclasm, you could say, you know, going against the mainstream narrative, trying to mm. re- reposition consciousness in a way that like, say, look, here's the box, here's the frame. Let's step outside of that frame. Let's let's expand our awareness and our consciousness. And so that. That involves spiritual practices and work. That involves, um, you know, the things that I've that I've made and, and worked on, um, and more importantly, it's just it's a way of life. Yeah. So I'm kind of fascinated by this notion of you growing up on uh, on set with your father and such. Uh, I have not personally connected with, or I don't have any any friends who are kind of inside the industry. So I'm I'm definitely wanting to kind of hear from you what was it like growing up in in hollywood the maybe you could tell different uh different sides of it obviously i'm I'm not trying to frame just a the obvious angle um mm-hmm. but just i mean what was that like for you yeah i mean the thing is i always try to like emphasize people you know i didn't grow up in a hollywood in any concept in any conception that people might have in hollywood yeah because my dad was not like a studio system filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of people that grew up much more like, you know, on the back lots of like Warner's or Universal or Disney or whatever. And like much more, you know, in the studio system, if you call it, right? And, you know, even people with, whose parents were lawyers or whatnot, like for the film business, 
you know, I guess Jonah, I think Jonah Hill is like one of them, you know, I went to school with like, like I think his dad was like a lawyer that was involved with, you know, Hollywood people. Like I would even say that was more Hollywood than what I had because my mm. perception was more like my dad was making movies in like Philippines and Dallas and New York uh-huh. and, you know, Thailand. And so we would travel the world and, we, you know, we get to like, you know, be on these sets, you know, you know, these amazing countries. And that was, you know, that's, that's not Hollywood, right? You're just, you're out right. there to make platoon, you know, platoon was in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. They, you know, he made the actors go through a two weeks boot camp, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and like, you know, basically live out in the jungle, you know, with Dale Dye, the, uh, the, the former Marine captain who was training them. Um, you know, and that's that's the way my dad liked to operate. I did the same thing in Alexander. I actually, was in that boot camp for like a week um, in Morocco. You know, like where they were training the young guys how to like form a phalanx and up and basically show up like you're in a you know you're in the military formation of uh, you know 300 BC. So hmm. you know, it's like you do the you know it's like so you travel. You know, that's that's my that's my point. Like I was not in Hollywood anyway. Like I was going on sets, and then when I come home, like yeah, we go to school like you know in a private school whatever in Santa Monica or Brentwood I mean but it wasn't in any way the Hollywood lifestyle of like going to parties and stuff that wasn't that wasn't you know that wasn't really my dad you know probably partied a lot more but I was a kid so you know I really wasn't in that lifestyle Mm -hmm. yeah I guess to clarify on on my end um, I didn't necessarily mean the physical location of Hollywood but even just like the industry and even even just as simple as like that's a really unique role to have your father living out you know what i mean like yeah. most most fathers are out here going working hard labor or going to a desk job and it's like this is like a kind of crazy like you probably really looked up to your dad growing up well we had a, you know it's we had a uh, an interesting relationship in the sense that uh you know my dad was I it actually I, I focused on this in my first documentary called um, "Fight Against Time." Oliver Stone's Alexander because I went to actually like shoot behind the scenes and on on Alexander when I was uh, I took a semester off from college to shoot it and um, we talk about you know the kind of the relationship where we had that he was kind of an absent father you know in many ways like yeah I was on sets but you know he was directing he was working and then also just his focus was so much on his on his filmmaking the first 10 years that I was born, mm-hmm. um, was a prolific time period. Yep. We would make a film every year. And so, um, you know, we had a sort of an absent, I would say an absent father relationship. Right. Until teenage years. And then we got, I think we bonded a lot more in my teenage years as I was, you know, it's like, you know, you get into puberty and you start hitting manhood and you need that guidance. I needed that guidance of a, of a father. Obviously, uh, he, he was there more at the time. Um, and so, yeah, we got closer and yeah, I mean, again, for me, my perspective was the fact that he introduced me to so many great, like interesting conversations and ideas, right? Like that was really what was fun with my dad. You know, we traveled the world and go to, you know, we went together to like, you know, the whole, to East Africa and, you know, Bosnia and Kosovo and Serbia and, you know, Tibet and India and Thai and Vietnam. I mean, like we had so many countries together, you know, China that like we had amazing trips and that was i think really where we were bonded just on these adventures yeah so when it comes to like your transition to being able to act in some of these movies is it is it as simple as just like oh well my dad's a director so if he wants to put me in he gets to put me in like like how does that work yeah i mean i mean when you're talking about like acting in like I was starting out in like Wall Street and the Doors and JFK and Natural Born Killers, and I was a kid. It wasn't right. I wouldn't even call it acting. I would just say like you know it was like cameos. It really was like doing like cameo roles, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know a few lines of dialogue and a couple scenes kind of thing. But um, no, when I actually started acting, it was I took it more seriously. I mean, I I studied a little bit in high school and college, and then um, you know took, taking classes like after college, and then I did my first film. Greystone, where I played myself in it. So that was very much my like step into being an actor on screen. And then after that, I got hired for, you know, various films um, that I starred in, you know, indie films, very small projects over the years. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was not because of my dad. Like the last thing I did with my dad was Savages, which was like, a, again, like a glorified cameo, you know, it's mm-hmm. a few months. Yeah. 
Okay. Since you've been in the industry and you've obviously, I can, I can already tell you kind of view yourself as like a contrarian to the industry, not like in the industry, but in the same sense, you're, you are, and you do come from the industry in the sense of like your actual work and what you do. Right. So like directing and film and all that stuff. So obviously my audience is very aware as you are, as I am, that industry tends to be very satanic. (laughs) Curious, did you ever experience anything firsthand worth, worth telling, or is it more of, as you grew up, um, you started to learn things uh, indirectly, let's say the way that I have, and then you kind of feel like, okay, I need to start speaking out about these things. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the thing is, you have to understand, uh, satanic Satanism, and this is something that I've gotten into, like, in different ways over the years, as far as I mentioned, going into, like, breaking into haunted mental hospitals, right? And one of yeah. the big you noticed in, in when you immediately, when you notice, you go into haunted spaces, like, that are notoriously haunted, is satanic markings, right? So you know that there are, there are literally, like, satanic cults and things that gather because the energy is so dark and you know, you've got like a Greystone, right? Which was a hospital that housed thousands of patients over 3000 of them died there, buried there. Right. So it's like you have death, but then you also have the madness that comes with the mental, <laughs> the mental hospital experience, right? Some people are just, you know, whatever. Some people are falsely accused of mental illness. And then a lot of people really have you know, mental illnesses, some of which you could, kind of correlate to demon possession or say that they actually are haunted by by spirits and demons and things like this so they bring that into that space so you find a lot of um in that energy that's been created by these by these spaces you then find satanists showing up and doing rituals there and think about that as far as like hollywood so hollywood i always said la was a mental hospital <laughs> <laughs> because so many people come there and it, they come from like, you know, from all walks of life, you know, some people are like really sweet and genuine. Other people are like really just egomaniacs and just lost in narcissists, whatever, lost in their dream worlds. And they're all showing up in this place. And this place has been gobbling up their energy for, mm. for decades, for decades. And you see it like literally overnight. Some people will come there like, you know, good Christian girl, like naive. Next- like out there like skinny dipping you know at this party like you know going, oh i'm a we had a cap like whatever like that kind of depravity <laughs> so the point is that like people lose themselves yep. in Hollywood. that's what i always like saw and this is what you know i think is is really a hallmark and when people talk about like the satanism it's not like everyone's you know in a cult there are cults of course there is like the oto kind of cults and the you know, whatever church of Satan kind of cults and, you know, things like that. And then obviously other Masons, obviously like Mason, Masonic cults and even Masons are not like I was initiated to Masonry. And that was a high, strange, highly strange experience because there are things operating on a multidimensional plane that start to come into your life and start to observe you. But even within Masonry, like there are good people. And then there's those that get like selected into like secret or more secretive cults within it. Like one Mason, I remember telling me, He's like, yeah, our, our our lodge, I found out, was like being used by OTO for like black magic rituals. And that's the point I'm trying to get at is that what you find is that there's something dark that's drawing and feeding upon the energy of people that are not necessarily satanic or evil, but obviously every human has darkness within us, right? And so you get a place like LA, which is basically built on the dreams of young, naive people. And as Marilyn Monroe described Hollywood, it's like they'll pay whatever, like $10,000 for a kiss and a, and a penny for your soul. I mean, that, that I'm paraphrasing it, but it was essentially yeah. that was her That's what Hollywood is. It's about prostitution. Mm. And it's like psychologically about prostitution. It's sometimes physically about prostitution, right? And so when you get that kind of culture where people are just out there trying to like be seen and heard, mm. right? And then you mean that's like the moral quandary of like how far you willing to go to get that to, yeah to, so you can easily prey upon the 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 people who are more willing to sell their souls or be drained and that's what i think really is going on so it's like there are different levels and layers to the energy feeding of that town the vampirism of that town like the fundamental like one guy you know you know the astral the astral projection right there's an astral world that you can see if you 
go into different states. I mean, it's like a dreamlike state, but you can basically see things that are not visible to the naked eye. You know, one is like the, the, the hell, most hellish place you ever visited in Astro was in Los Angeles. And oh, I believe, wow. you yeah. know, I just, I believe it because it's like Sodom and, you know, it's like, it's like Sodom to like mm. Vegas or more. I mean, in some ways it's worse LA because again, mm -hmm. The Vegas, you know, it's mobbed up and you know, it's about gambling. You know, it's about sin. Like LA is supposed to be about dreams and hope and magic. Yeah. And like, no, it's, it really is about, I think more soul crushing than anything. Wow. Yeah. That's really, that's really eye opening. So what is, um, what does OTO stand for? Oh, Auto Templus Orientis. That's, um, that was created by, uh, not created by Alistair Crowley took over. It was actually originally, I think a German, like uh Templar kind of, um, Secret Society, Alistair Crowley, he like imbued it with his stuff and 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 essentially uh, dispatched it. And I think the head of OTO initially out in LA was uh, Jack Parsons. They made a show actually kind of dealing with that um, uh, about Jack Parsons. He was one of the founders in a sense of JPL, Jeff Propulsion Lab, because he was like a major, uh, you know, uh, what physicist. I mean, he was basically, he was a major, like he was one of the geniuses of rocket, of early rocket engineering. But he was heavily into the OTO, um, and it basically is like you could say it's darker magic because it's more based on your own will. So I always look at it like black magic versus white magic is very simple. Black magic is my will, basically over everything. Yeah, as as Crowley put it, like basically, uh, love is under will. Will is more important than love. Yes, white magic is actually thy will. So it's basically aligning your will with the with the higher will. Yes. So it's getting your will to love. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like saying, OK, you know what? This is, you know, it's like it's like the, the angry child. Right. Like the little stubborn child. It's like no matter what, I want what I want. Right. I don't care what it costs. I don't care who it hurts. Yeah. Right. Like that's the lower level. Then the higher level will is like I want what I want. But if it's not in harmony and if it's if it's trespassing on others or it's like theft, you know, if like you're stealing or taking from others, then I don't want it. That's the higher will. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I look at white versus black. So like white magic is. Okay, working with will in conjunction with the, the holistic natural universe and not not imposing myself upon others. Yeah, I can't help but feel like Hollywood doesn't appreciate who you've grown to become. <laughs> ah. well, they, Hollywood doesn't even appreciate my father. So, you know, I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. So at what age did you begin to to awaken i don't want to make you like tell your your whole kind of origin and dark knight story and all that but um if you could just maybe give us an an overview of like how do you grow up in that and then become this and we're going to get into what this is but i mean you know you're very much so doing positive work for humanity the earth consciousness and all of that well i appreciate that thank you um I don't feel that I, that's what I was trying to go back to. Like, I didn't grow up in that. That's what I was trying to, you know, basically like explain. Right. I was more in the, in the realm of like the filmmaking world, which is, okay. you know, like a lot of good people, right? Like people that work on movies that are just like, you know, the crew and like the, 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 the laborers, like right. people that like work, right. And they, they work for a living. Right. Yeah. So I really was like seeing that I was okay. seeing the actual, like the, the work I wasn't seeing like, you know, the, I get what until, you're saying. So later in my life, like when yes. I think I came back to LA, like in my twenties and I was like hanging out and that's when I was like, starting to see more of like the energy and I was more sensitive to the energy. So my consciousness, I would say was like growing consistently, but really the, the awakening moment you could say for me was, or one of the early wake awakening moments was, um, going to, um, uh, India with my dad and also Tibet. We did like a trip you know, to the Himalayas, essentially we went to India and then went to the Ganges and to the place where Siddhartha, you know, the deer park where Siddhartha was said to have like awakened. So he was teaching me about Buddhism and I was like nine years old. Wow. Uh, was like nine or 10? No, I was 10. And, and so this was like very much important, I think in my consciousness, because I was seeing the contrast in extreme contrast, you know, India is such a spirit, you know, it's, it's a materialist land. It's also a spiritual land. Oh yeah. You know, you see the great contrast. I mean, people talk about inequality in the world. Like, I think India is one of the most striking examples of inequality where you see, like, I saw, you know, like a little baby die, like basically dead, like in the, you know, in the street. And it's just like, and then you're like, 
you know, you have like a million people in like a square mile, just like this mass of humanity. And people are like, you know, peeing in the street and like living in, in the street. And they have like, you know, you have your Ritz Carlton, you know, next door. <laughs> it's like, wow. it's just, yeah, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's really like, it's really striking. It's important, like in a way for the psyche to like see that. And so I think as a kid, it was really important for me to then come back to Los Angeles with a, ooh, I don't, I don't need materialism as much. Like, I don't really care as much about the toys because I'd gone through that. Okay, I got the toys. I know what toys were. And in many ways, like being spoiled as a kid, I think was a blessing because it was like, okay, I got, I got it out of my system. Yeah. Being deprived. I think a lot of people are deprived when they're kids. So then they want the rest of their life. They're like seeking the toys, right? They're trying to, and they're turning people into toys. They're turning, you know, whatever lifestyle into toys. And I think when you have it, like as a kid, you kind of start to work that through. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, I don't need the toys as much. I can, I can appreciate what I have but I don't need the material to, to, to fill me. There's now a quest for the spiritual, for the, what is it that actually fulfills me? What is it that actually makes me, you know, feel connected and feel love and right. And feel more at peace. Yeah. So what I'm almost hearing is you needed to experience immense suffering in order to expand your kind of compassion and, and give you perspective for what you actually desired from your life. And when I say immense suffering, I'm not referencing your own, but seeing the capacity for human suffering, it sounds like did something to you. And then when you came back, you're like, oh, this, in a sense, it's almost like LA, you come back to LA and you're like, this isn't real life. Yeah. Would you say that that's fairly accurate? Yeah. In conscious, in my, in my awareness, yes. Now, obviously like that I still live my life with my friends and still like enjoy my, my childhood to a large extent. I feel, although for a few years, I do remember like going into like this really just like interesting space in my psyche, like 12, 13, like right around puberty, I would say like this just like burden of like, oh, fuck, what am I, you know, like I got to do something with my life. And I was just really like focused, future focused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I was just like almost pushing away childhood things, you know, in a very striking way. I just remember like feeling like I can't have fun. And it was a really interesting yeah. time where it was like almost like, for you know for like a well, it was almost years where it was just like i was like rejecting fun mm. from, like, in a way it was like that's a waste of time that's not good for me that's like oh yeah almost like fun was bad like a bad thing you know mm -hmm. they had that balance yet i was still like i think trying to work through like what the hell like what am i here to do and how do yeah. i do it? i gotta be serious and really like i gotta work hard and i mean that that drive got me to like to an Ivy League college and like really pushed me through high school in many ways. But I did remember that break where it was just like, I miss my childhood. And I think I, yeah. I can't, like to different points, you said, you just sort of feel, reflect like, man, the nostalgia for like being a kid again. And how do I re reclaim that fun? And it's, it's something to, you know, that I still work with, like mm -hmm. finding those things that are fun in life, right? Because you had it when you're a kid in some ways, right? You're just like, just pure play and innocence. And then as you get older, it's just like, where do you find that fun again? Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people find it with having kids and, you know, re, you know, reliving that childhood with the kids, but it really is important for us in our consciousness to, to, to bring that spirit of play into our lives on a daily basis. Very true. Yeah. I can personally relate to that. And I think a lot of the audience can, in terms of a lot of us for various different reasons, when you get put in a situation where you feel like you need to grow up fast, then you sure you're the biological age of a kid but you're taking on responsibilities even if it's just in your own psyche and your own consciousness but taking on responsibilities that are not childlike and you kind of miss out on those years i very much relate to that as well and returning to that play is definitely a part of the healing work the amount of travel and different cultures that you got to experience at a young age has obviously deeply impacted you and i can only imagine what that does to a kid to see to see the entire world as you're growing up would you say that your parents and or your father were they at all spiritual religious like what were what were or are their views how did they kind of raise you was it just open-minded or did they have actual views yeah so i think i mentioned that when my dad took me to uh india and tibet he was teaching me about buddhism because he was himself uh, a new practitioner to Buddhism. He basically had started started learning about it and practicing it when I was like seven. So wow. I meditation 
from that point, like kind of morning on morning meditation practice. And, and they started to try to, you know, to teach me about it, um, about teaching me about boredom, right? Like, especially in that time, remember like what's cool about that time period was that we didn't have this immediacy of the, the, the smartphone, right? It's like, it's, it's such a shift in consciousness, as you know, that took place, you know, really like post 2010, 11, probably, right? With all the apps and the smart, like the iPhone going smart and everything. And so like going back to like that time, there was like such an innocence to, you know, travel, like just, even just like being a kid, right? Like you just, you know, whatever, like you could watch a movie or something, put on a video, but like for the most part, you know, you guys get into Nintendo, um, but for the most part, it was like, you'd have to deal with boredom. And, you know, if you didn't have friends around to play with, right, like card games or just thinking, you know, like writing, my dad taught me like, you know, just write, you know, whatever it was, write your stories or draw or just like, you know, start to create things. Um, and so that, I think, was in a way the beginning of spiritual practice. I mm -hmm. feel like boredom, right? Like you said, suffering, suffering and boredom. Are yes, really important. boredom is a great teacher. <laughs> right? Start getting us into spiritual practice. Um and so that was, you know, that was my father's teachings. My mom was, um, you know, like Catholic school, rejected, you know, reject, rejected Catholicism, right? Um, took me to like church on like Christmas, maybe, you know, like we'd go to like Christmas mass kind of thing. But no way was it going to be like a, an indoctrinated perspective of Christianity. Right. Actually, we would go to like self-realization fellowship, which is um, Yogananda's uh, thing, which incorporated... Yeah all the different religions and i think that was very impactful for me even though we didn't go often it was just like whenever we did it was it was really about like the different teachings they would read from you name it you know sufism or uh judaism or whatever like they would impart you know hinduism they would impart some teachings right because it was really that's the essence to me of spirituality is like not having a dogma it's being you know it's being able to see the truth in anything if you had to give like two or three core values that were instilled into you what would you say they were from, <laughs> your, from your parents that's an interesting question i'm so curious god has assigned us to go out and take dominion over the earth yet somewhere along the line we've forgotten that to know god is to know wealth and to love god is to love wealth and use that wealth to build his kingdom. If you're listening to this right now, there are three things that I know about you. Number one, you value freedom above just about anything else in life. Number two, you are awake to the matrix that we have been living in. And number three, you understand that having a seat at the table and making real change requires real money and resources and you are here to step into that. For the majority of you watching this right now, your number one limitation to experiencing real freedom is cash flow. You want to realize your larger purpose on earth, but you simply haven't figured out how to not trade your time for money. And this keeps you reliant on the very system you so deeply want to break free from. We're not meant to live this way. You're here for a very specific purpose, Neo. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. You've just fallen asleep to it. Along my journey over the last decade plus, I've built and ran four successful businesses in completely different niches in the online space. I now run a multi-million dollar per year personal brand that only requires about 10 to 15 hours of my time per week, and I've built an organic audience of hundreds of thousands of followers and subscribers across various social media platforms. But most importantly, I've managed to build all of this while remaining completely in alignment with my core values, my morals, and my higher purpose of why God put me on earth. Many of us have the root belief that we cannot both be truly of service to others and walking in our larger purpose and make an abundance of money via capitalism. And I am here to tell you that that is simply your fear and smallness talking. 
my life today looks like a dream. Complete time freedom, luxury cars, 4,000 square foot house with land, never looking at receipts when buying things, tipping incredibly well, eating at five-star restaurants, while also deeply walking in my purpose and devoting my entire life to serving God and serving others. When approached with this intention, business is simply a vehicle through which we self-actualize on our spiritual path. And this is why I'm sharing this brief announcement with you today. I am incredibly excited to announce that we have finally launched a potent, potent offering potent. to help you guys clarify your higher calling, build a highly profitable business and brand around that calling, and then scale that business to solve your cash flow problems permanently. I have poured my heart and soul into this offering the Aligned Entrepreneur Academy, and it encapsulates all I have learned over the last decade of my entrepreneurial journey as a heart-led entrepreneur. AE Academy is a real-life MBA in conscious business in the modern digital world, and you can have lifetime access to this plus all future updates for less than the price of a new MacBook. Check out the link in the description below for more info. I'll see you on the inside, my friend. Because I don't even know if the core values that they instill are necessarily right. That's why, I mean, it's been interesting. I, like, often they're not. <laughs> how often I, I've been deconstructing belief systems, yes. right? And, and, and uh, things that have been imparted to me just you know, which with the expectation that it's true, just because, you know, whatever it was taught to you is the way things are, or the yep. way that your, your culture, your, whatever your family did things. And so, um, you know, when it comes to like three core values, like, I mean, interestingly enough, I would say with my mom, it was, um, to follow your heart. I think that actually was a very big message from her and something that I think it, to this day, I actually, I understand more now. Than I did before because the heart actually is intelligent. And as we know with science, it's like confirming more and more the heart actually does mm -hmm. have intelligence. You, yep. you can actually measure, right? The, the the energy of frequency of someone's heart and how it affects people like, you know, feet around them, if not mm -hmm. further, right? Um, so the heart, you know, having intelligence, I think this is really an important aspect of following your heart. Um, I want to say with my father, I think the core value was very much like just the 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 necessity of work work and, hard and and this is where i think i've kind of been working against that notion of like mm -hmm. you got to work and earn it as opposed to just like no i don't i don't think that's the way it has to be like i think you can you can deserve it just from being good and mm -hmm. showing up right and being you and you can deserve everything that comes to you and you don't have to work hard to earn it like that's like an old idea you know idea of like how things come and it's like sometimes you can work really hard and get nothing out of it and then sometimes you just like you just relax and things flow to you as you know with conscious wealth so that's why i'm like saying i'm really deconstructing that whole concept of like you got to work to earn it, as opposed to like you know i think work work smart work with love work with what you feel like you want to do and not just you know don't make an obligation and yeah. because it doesn't necessarily give you what you're putting in, you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily getting out of or getting more out of from what you're putting in, unless you're doing it with, in the right flow and the right intention, in the right moment. Such a, such a man to teach you that <laughs> such right. a, such a traditional masculine perspective. And um, yeah, you know, you know what I hear first off to clarify, the reason I asked that was because I assume what you were taught has had to have some degree of unlearning. And that just speaks to your spiritual evolution right it's like our parents they they do the best they can as their parents did as their parents did but you know they were raised in a very different world and they were raised humanity was at a different level of consciousness right and if you're into astrology and all that like the stars are in different alignment and we were in different eras and all that so it's like the lesson of more like our generation seems to be like that such a hyper masculine lens isn't necessarily always helpful 
right? Like we swung too far that way. And then we came all about like, oh, screw the patriarchy. And, and now we're having some trouble with that. And now it's swinging back to hopefully center, right? <laughs> we can have a big conversation about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's funny to just watch like how human, like if you just zoomed out and you were an alien and you were just watching humans, like that would be better than any TV show ever, right? Because we're just, we're kind of funny in that sense. We just get all all tribal towards one side and then it swings to the other and then in reality, if we could just somehow meet in the middle, we'd have we'd get a lot more accomplished. <laughs> so, if you, uh, if you can go to one extreme and then the other really quickly, you can make your way back to the, the middle faster. The problem is, we go. From, it takes too long to go from extreme to extreme. If we could just do it really quick, right? It's yes. like in your go to the extreme and then go to the other extreme. It's like a sprint, and then you'll yeah. find yourself back really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I feel like when we when we look around right now, I'm I'm actually even a little surprised to say it, but from from what I'm seeing, we are actually achieving some semblance of the middle. It seems like the 2020 stuff was never going to end, and now we're seeing all sorts of not only people come forward. You know, we have voices that are very much so uniting people in the middle, like. RKJ. And we have a lot of people speaking out about some things that were forced in us not actually being what, what we were told. And we seem to have a growing majority in the middle that we did not have three years ago. And so, you know, ideally, heading into 2024, we see less polarity and divisiveness and more meeting in the middle, because in reality, most of us are that middle. It's just that the most kind of polarizing voices rise to the top. And so that's all we're hearing and it, that can really influence us. But I want to kind of pivot the conversation now more into more of a conversation, I'm not trying to just sit here and grill you with questions about your upbringing. But personally, I was just like, when we connected, I had no idea of like your actual background. And when I started to dive in it, I was just like, oh man, I just, I got to ask some of these questions, even just, even just for myself. Cause that's, you know, that's a fascinating upbringing. I mean, I took a, I took a class in high school. I always talk about an art of film class and it changed my life. It was, it was the, from all 18 years of my public schooling before going to college, it was my single favorite class. And I'm not like one of those, like, uh, artistic types either. <laughs> I was more of the math dude, <laughs> more of the logical type. And I, and I just loved the class and it just shaped how I viewed the world. And ever since then, I've been obsessed with, you know, that's how I got introduced to the matrix. And I was watching that class and I wasn't viewing it as a fit, as a sci-fi movie. <laughs> I was like, there are deeper implications here. And, and that's part of what I love about cinema is you can really you can really uh, get a point across without getting a point across if, you, if you're following what I'm saying. <laughs> so I want to pivot, like I said, into, into more of a conversation. I think, you know, we have a lot in common, though our backgrounds are different. We're really, you know, on the same mission here and we're trying to, you know, educate people, um, awaken people to, to remember, you know, who we are, why we're here, um, what we are, if you want to say it like that in, in a sense. And so one thing I've noticed about you is that you you like to study and create artistic masterpieces, but really a big piece of that I can imagine is, is research. Um, the, the level of, of like multifaceted nature of your work is, is pretty impressive. I mean, you're speaking on things about the financial systems, but then you're also speaking on things like the elites and you're speaking on Hollywood and media. And so, so it's pretty like wide. And that's what we do at this podcast, but it's kind of, it's not normal. It's not every day you come across someone who's wide because in the Western world, we're all about specialize, specialize. And so most people are trapped into this little box. And so I salute you as a fellow person who's like, take me out of the box. You also are, are obviously marching to your own drum. I want to start off by just having a little, maybe a little riff in, in, Obviously, a big piece of what we talk about on this podcast is pertaining to the financial system. What are some of the core kind of discoveries you found since diving into the realm of the financial world that most opened your eyes to, okay, I need to 
do something about this. I need to, whether that be personally, right? I need to shift the way I'm living or whether that be like in terms of humanity. Okay, I need to speak out against this. What are some of those core tenants for, for my audience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, whole, whole rabbit hole. Yeah, so I mean, with the financial system, I mean, in general, I've been aware of, thankfully, like the Federal Reserve being a private bank since I was like high, in high school. Right. I mean, I read the creature from Jekyll Island, uh, Griffin's Amazing. book. Yep. At that, that was, you know, I really did like a deep dive into a lot of things. At, in high school, it was like, I remember like 15, 16, 17, 18, like my was really starting to get, oh, I was really starting to wake up because this was like just before 9 11 and just after 9 11. Mm. It was like before 9 11, I was really into like the assassinations, right? The RFP. Yeah fascination but my dad made jfk but like i was hmm. my own like research into it so i'm like okay this movie's so fascinating and inspired me to want to read more learn more that leads you to like you know the nature of reality like cia is running black ops right okay but who is cia most of cia is like directors are basically like bankers so like they're they're either like on the boards so that you know they're either like the boards of the, the major financial you know new york banks or like lawyers for those you know, major law firms that are, you know, for the banks, you know, like Dulles, for example, they were lawyers for a major Sullivan Cromwell, you know, law firm that represents all these big corporations and corporations that were dealing with the Nazis and banks that were, you know, that were, uh -oh. that were you know, that you say the banks that were uh, financing Hitler, that kind of stuff before he came yeah. to power. Well, that was more through England. But the point is that like, I'm still becoming familiar with like, okay, where is power in this world, right? Because once you start to understand that like wars are not, because someone's ego is bruised and so, you know, he sends people off to war. It's like, no, in order to mobilize a whole society, you have to manipulate that society. And then to, to manipulate society, there has to be an agenda of media, of finance, right? And um, and military, right? Coming together. So, you know, that implies a financial interest. You know, you don't go to war if there's not a financial interest. So again, like I was starting to, you know, wake up to a lot of these, these aspects of conspiracy when 9-11 occurs, and then, you know, through that time period, I was just like, I was reading David Icke, I was reading um, uh, Jim Mars, you know, who did some great work on, even on on the rule by secrecy was one book about secret societies, another book I think did on like the alien stuff, and just like the UFOs. I read books, like I said, on the Federal Reserve System. And so I was aware that there's this, say, like, private financial side of things that's creating money and lending it to us, you know, the government, to the U.S. government. But as you know, as you go through it, you start to realize more and more, well, the United States government is actually a corporation. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> are the assets were the collateral, right, for the debt. And then you start to get deeper into that. And to me, like one of the most, most important things to really comprehend, this only came to me last last year or this year, was understanding that like banks don't create don't don't actually loan you money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when you really start to fathom that, that banks don't loan you money, every time you sign whether it's an application or a note, they just use that, they collateralize that, and they create the money based on that that signature. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute, you're gonna create money, give it to me that I have to pay back plus interest, and then you can take that note and <clears throat> sell it. Right. Money off of that. Whoa, that's pure gangster. <laughs> we call we call that triple dipping. <laughs> I wanted that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, being a being a banker is a is a different level of is a different level of power. So it sounds like you have a, a similar background in starting out with just like the general what society calls conspiracy theories, which is a wonderful word, right? When you study its origins, but starting out with more of the general, asking some of these questions, and then kind of led you into okay, Federal Reserve. Whoa, what's going on here? And then. More, uh, more recently, if I understand correctly, you kind of um, started to get more into the sovereignty realm and, and the teachings of that. Right, right. Well, so I, I learned about it 10 years ago or more from Jordan Maxwell, um, who I was friendly with. And, you know, we, we met up and started telling me this stuff about, it's like, yeah, so basically, you know, the United States is a corporation. When you're born, you get a certificate of birth, which is what. <laughs> Cargo gets when it arrives at a port. So basically, you know, your your uh, collateral, your cargo, that is, just, you know, your straw man essentially is your all caps name, and 
just started explaining these things to me, right? Um, and so I remember I was like, I I know about this stuff. I know people that were doing things, but I was very hesitant to get involved because I'm like, first of all, it's a lot of time and energy, as I found in the last few months. A lot of time to <laughs> really focus your mind and, and and give yourself to this to this understanding and this in this way of being. Yes, but I didn't have the guidance. I didn't have like the mentor, mm-hmm. like Matt talked about it, but I, I mean. He wasn't, I wasn't necessarily going to like go and, and, and do it in, in his modality. I didn't have like a modality to follow. So mm-hmm. happened, I think really was with COVID realizing just how people's rights were stripped. So I was like, Ooh, intuitively, I'm like, Ooh, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta claim sovereignty. Cause if you don't call it, if you don't call this out, if you don't stop this relationship with this corporate self, you know, your straw man self, and you don't basically separate yourself from your, from your all caps name and disidentify from that basically or just say that's my public self but that's not me and you know start to actually claim your sovereignty in relationship to yourself your your mind your body spirit your land your property you name it your relationship to the banks your relationship to every contract you've ever signed if you don't start to recognize it and start to reclaim it you will be at the behest of this corporate government that can basically say you can't travel here you have to put that mask on to go do that you have to take this shot you have to you can't do business, like all these things, right? So that's when I started to realize, okay, we got to really start to reconsider how powerful and important this sovereignty movement is. And, um, and you know, as a, basically as a principle of going back to constitutional republic, you know, that's the goal. Ultimately, we want to get back to the constitutional republic, not this corporate, what do they call it? I mean, it's, it's basically a plutocracy, right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, 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 it's gangster, it's gangster, it's gangster gangsterism, but we need to get back to the Republic, which is, you know, basically a limited government, the Bill of Rights being honored, yep. respected, basically the, the ninth and 10th Amendments, the, 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 that which we do not give to the federal government to do, which is really supposed to be limited in its scope, right? They're not supposed to be doing, you know, running our economy as they do now. The federal government is 30 to 40 percent, I think, of GDP annually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think of what that is, right? Yep. No, that's not what the federal government was designed to be. It was supposed to just be very limited as far as protecting the United States mm-hmm. on a military front and maybe, you know, doing some things with like roads across states, you know, that's, you know, interstate commerce, that's about it. Now they've gotten into every walk of life as we know, right? And birth and death. So I think we got to get, get away from that overbearing nanny state, mm-hmm. but it's really go back to like, you're talking about like people in the middle. The problem is that people have gotten in this culture of the government. I have to trust the government. I have to yep. listen to the, obey the government you know the government knows best and it's just like we got to get out that's a child it's a child mentality you know as we grow into grown men women and kings and queens that we are meant to be and that we should be right you think about this world you're like i'm a king why the heck is that charles is a king no i'm a king (laughs) we got to get past this psychology of like looking at people like they are higher than us but i've lived with it my whole life because in many ways i see it with people like you know they look at you like oh oliver stone it's like they pedestalize and we do it we do it all the time. Like we fetishize, we pedestalize, we 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 are hypnotized by like people that are on TV, like they're they have more importance than I do. Like, no, mm-hmm. no, you're the king. <laughs> you're the queen. Own yep. it. Own your word. And that's exactly why I spent time going into that, because I know that that aspect of of humans is like, oh my God, he's been on TV. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yep. in reality, the sovereignty, you know, it's it's so interesting that you bring that up. What what comes to mind when you're talking about kind of like this notion of how we we've just over time accepted that there's like a, a hierarchy that some people are better than others and that there are some people that because they're in a position of authority, they know they must know better than us. And so we should listen to them. And it starts as simple as kindergarten. When you're told to sit down, you're told when you can go pee, you're told when you, and then you go into elementary and you're told when you can go to the next class and you're told when you can eat lunch and you're told when you can go home. And I've done content on this and it's like, that is the the programming. It starts early, right? It's not programming. Isn't just about like the information they're teaching. It's about how they're training you at an unconscious level. Don't step out the lines. Right. And think about, think about not, think about 2020 in that perspective, as you know. Yeah, 20, 2021 and how people were like, the science says, mm-hmm. science guy on TV told me, mm-hmm. oh, the doctors have decided. Can you think, can you actually think for yourself for a moment? Can you yeah. actually 
like get out of the the the, the frame of they know better and no i know my body better i know my intuition i know my reality this doesn't make sense and if like you start to just do a little bit of research you start to do a little bit of say wait a minute why is this being suppressed if this is so if the, you know like why are they so trying so hard to suppress people for saying like hcq is i mean you know and doctors who are saying i'm treating thousands of patients with hcq and zinc and we're and we're and we're saving lives oh well that's a conspiracy if they're treating patients and they're helping people what is the conspiracy yeah. <laughs> it's like it just this is where i'm like mind boggled going that why are you trying to suppress a doctor who's just saying i'm treating patients and i'm out and, and we're having success why are you trying to suppress that why wouldn't you just say huh that's great okay you know move on if you don't believe that that's fine but you're so, trying so hard to say that they're that they're that, you know can't be trusted because we haven't done a a, a randomized clinical trial really you can do a randomized clinical trial to save someone for, who's who's dying i don't think so i think you you try what's available right and it's like, this is psychology people. They, they would just sit back and go, well, the doctors, the doctors out there, you know, agree that it's, you know, you can't treat COVID. I have to stay here in my house with my mask on until they tell me to come out. 2020 was absolutely bananas. I think the craziest part for me was you couldn't fake where you were at internally. Mm -hmm. We had a whole lot of people like uh, the tide went out and you saw how many people were standing there naked in a sense and, and what i mean by that kind of analogy is like when times are good it seems like um maybe we're smarter than we are and then when crisis hits you really see oh my god i'm surrounded by people that cannot and do not think for themselves and even something as simple as you know you know, we would go to the grocery store and I'm like, I'm not wearing a mask. And, uh, you know, you have confrontations with various people and I would be quoting, citing direct law and they'd, I'm getting my manager. And it's like, perfect. Your manager doesn't know law either. Bring him out. <laughs> like, and then they're like, oh, we have to kick you out. It's policy. And I'm like, cool. Policy doesn't supersede federal law. <laughs> and like, we just go back and, and it's like, people were terrified to step outside the boxes. And it's like, that was just a warm up, Like, everyone just fell into that and and i'm not saying this to like remove the concept of health and mask and all the all the things that they polarize to like virtue signal remove all that 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 was just the topic at hand it will always switch and rotate but the the real conversation here is just it goes back to a video that me and aaron abke did recently in our matrix series which is the illusion of authority Yes. Why did our whole nation just start taking advice from some of the most unhealthy people in existence on their health? Why, why <laughs> did we just line up in single file lines and, and do what we were told when it's like, your government has shown you a track record of nothing but mistruth after mistruth after scandal after conspiracy. <laughs> well, well it's like, it's like there was a moment, I think someone asked Fauci, I think it was like Julia Roberts or someone asked Fauci, like, what do you do for COVID? And he's like, I would do vitamins. I do, well, he's like, or for your daily basis, I do vitamin C and vitamin D. Oh, wait, didn't you guys say don't do vitamin C and vitamin D? Like, <laughs> everyone was like, don't use vitamin C and vitamin D for COVID or to treat or anything like this. It was just really funny moment where like Fauci acknowledged that he like, that he uses those. And, and it's like, that's the whole point that was, as you say, the authority, the idea of authority that people in a store, they're so terrified to think for themselves or actually like having to like discern for themselves. So fall back to authority. And we've seen this throughout history, right? Because it's scary to actually like be a human being and be like, yeah, this doesn't make sense. Or, you know, what? intuitively I'm following my intuition yep. and you're fine. Don't worry about it. You know, that's, that's where the breaking point for me is like, in this collective experience is the breaking point the separation point is those that actually trust their intuition, understand that they have an intuition, understand that they're connected to God. We're living beings, you know? So guess what? Your immune system, your body, this is a miracle. You know, you could literally die tomorrow from any number, countless mm -hmm. ailments, illnesses, cancers, coconuts falling out of trees, car accidents, whatever, right? But the point that we're here is, I believe, you know, by, 
a higher power. And I think this was the real interesting thing was that to me, it was like the conservatives all of a sudden who in many ways were like more extreme in their reaction for, for 9-11, right? And the war on terror were the ones that got it more with 2020 because I think they tend to have more of a, a faith. Like even, you know, even if you want to call it dogmatic or whatnot, but a faith will give you that realization of like, hey, this is God's work. Like this immune system is God's work. And this is something that's like higher than our intelligence that designed us. So what are we in here like freaking out about and like, you know, getting so hysterical about why don't we have a little bit of faith and trust that, you know, we're here for a reason. And and, and so that I think that was the break for the, the liberal mindset that probably tends to be the more atheistic. And um, and speaking of, of, of like authority, think about how the parodying of, of like how authority in the George Floyd situation, right, mm. was like everything that the liberals were saying they were against. Right. They're like, we don't want, you know, the authority, the police to be like, you know, basically, you know, on this guy's neck or whatever, yep. you know, was essentially like putting force on him, putting him down. Right. Mm-hmm. I say breathe. That's literally what we were all saying. You have an authority figure who's yes. mask on you and you're like, I can't breathe with this mask on. And you're telling mm-hmm. me to put this on now. Thankfully, obviously, it didn't kill most of us to wear the mask. But you know what? It does have negative effects, as we know, on your yep. body. Uh, it. it <laughs> Look at it, the mask. It's like a petri dish of nasty, you know, ba- recycled bacteria, and it's not what you want. Mm-hmm. You want a system. So it's like, but we are out here basically as like George Floyd saying, "I can't breathe," and the liberals are like, "Yeah, we hate the authority figure when it's the cop, but they love being the authority figure when it's only to put the mask on." And I think yeah. that was really like an interesting, interesting moment, right, in the dichotomy of psychology, where it's like, "Hey, man, I'm against the authority figure in all senses when the authority figure disrespects you. I have no problem with the police officer." But if, if he doesn't respect the person, then we have a problem, just like anyone, right? Just like you, any, you know, you, me, anyone else in this society. Like, I have no problem. I respect anybody until they basically disrespect or they go beyond, you know, what, what's, uh, what's their, their, like, respectful way of behaving to each other. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, a perfect, perfect point to highlight there is, like, it's a very political thing to do, <laughs> to, to pick and choose uh rhetoric as it suits your kind of narrative but the the core essence we're speaking to is is this authority and on the one side we have a um the the more liberal stance is very much so like to be anti-authority when it comes to almost things that have to do with like gender or race they're very anti-authority right but when it comes to things outside of that it's how dare you, how insensitive of you to be anti X. They changed the word from authority to the experts or the science and all that. And it's, it's fascinating if you know how to critically think, (laughs) but if you don't, then you're just like, this makes sense. I better listen to it. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. I'm curious, how did you, do you remember how you came across my page? Was there like a specific post? did someone mention it? Were you just scrolling? Do you remember? I think someone, I think someone mentioned you, to be honest, um, because because they were, I think some of the interviews that I've done on sovereignty and things like that, I think someone said, hey, you should check out, you know, Jay Griff. And that was probably what led me there. Cool, cool. So I'm, I have to ask this. Based on like the, the connections that you have in, you know, you have a background in like journalism, you have a background in um, creating movies, directing um, obviously even like your upbringing and the acting and stuff like that. Do people in any of these industries, like some of the higher up connections, do any of these people know about sovereignty? Like does a, does a Robert Kennedy know what sovereignty is? Does like some of these, uh, higher ups that you've interviewed or anything, like, do they know what a straw man is? <laughs> I'm just, ah, man. Well, see, and, and here's the thing, like, to care would be to basically go back to the idea of authority figures. Yeah. Right. That, this is but it I'm is fascinating, right? Back. Like, I think the person that I would be more interested in knowing about would be like Trump. Yeah. Well, that's the question I always get asked because I've done a video. My most viral video was on etymology and I showed this tweet of Trump talking about the uh, for, how the 14th Amendment turned people into a slave. And I showed I, this tweet. Uh, have you seen that? And people always try to tell me it's fake because they can't find it because he deleted it. Um, it's not fake. Anyway, 
I always get asked that like uh, about Trump. Uh, why does he, why doesn't he speak out about this stuff? If blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I, we'll never know. I'll, at least I'll never know. But I'm just curious if you've ever had conversations with any people who aren't necessarily like, it's just a question I get asked a lot. Like a, yeah. like yeah. a Robert Kennedy. It's like, Would do he, these, yeah. do these people realize that they're only going to be able to make so much change as long as they're trying to make it within the confines of a system that runs the way it's meant to run versus the the sovereignty approach is recognizing okay things are working exactly as they're meant to and you just remove yourself entirely from the confines of the game you were previously playing let me put it like this people should be optimistic i would suggest that some of the people that i know that have been that have been in, that have been around and involved with the sovereignty for, for 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 decades are the ones that would tell me and confirm the republic is back. There is a United States Republic. It has been restored, and a lot of what we are seeing, as far as like the Q kind of narrative of reality, is playing out exactly as a movie has to play out. And it's not hopium. It's literally just it's like trust the process and basically trust the process and do your work. It's not saying like, don't do your work. You know, if, if everyone's being called to different things, right? The sovereignty movement is growing. People are talking about it on TikTok and sharing videos. And oh, it's yeah. A good thing. Like people are doing their part and there is behind the scenes support. Yes. But mm. as far as what like an art, like it, it would be interesting to talk to someone like, you know, Bobby about it. Obviously, like he's running for president. It's like it's impossible to have that conversation. But oh, yeah. Because he's a lawyer, you know, he's the kind of person that you could absolutely have right. this with or even debate you know and say like okay you know he doesn't agree have a debate he'd be a really interesting person but you don't need to because from a different vantage point there's so much that's there's so many different like things that are at work on different le levels right within the system of oh yeah of government and as i said like there i i'm 100 know the qfs quantum, quantum financial system is in play the public is in play all these things are happening, but it's like playing out in a certain way that it's the most, it's maximizing the process, I believe is about maximizing awareness and acceptance, right? So it's like when you can get people to start talking about, La, you know, Lahaina as an attack and, yep. you know, basically calling out Oprah and these other, you know, dark, oh, God. dark people, uh, dark's not dark skin, dark celebrity, you know, dark. Uh, <laughs> Glad you clarified that so we yeah. don't get canceled. <laughs> yeah these dark energy beings like oprah and it's like you know this is the point like certain things like will continue to play out because it just continues to awaken the energy of us because we are the energy that's driving this that's mm -hmm. the thing it's collective energy you know you can't just count how powerful collective energy is right yep you know with intention like as people start to wake up and they say man this situation is is messed up and they don't know what to do about it but their energy of awakening already is prompting change because yeah. once you see something right it's like it's like once you see that there's like a a guy walking around picking pockets all of a sudden you're watching him it changes the entire dynamic before you were unaware that this guy was walking around picking, all of a sudden you change the dynamic of it right you can, that guy can no longer operate the same because all of a sudden he's being watched that's like to me that's the whole deep state like biden is the deep state spokesman what a great what a what a great clown show for people to to observe and watch this right i mean it's like it's just it's hilarious because this is their this is their spokesman <laughs> <laughs> they might be regretting that one <laughs> what a great, i think it's all by choice i think this is all by design i think this is the best way to like out the deep state for what it is yeah yeah it's hilarious you can't make this shit up it's uh it's good stuff so you spend far more time than than most people um, in my opinion, researching and, and just in the nature of, of your work, it, it requires you to have an understanding that, you know, the average person doesn't need to have, because in order for you to have integrity in your work, like you obviously need to research things, uh, to a deep level from your perspective, uh, what would you say people need to do on an individual level for us to turn things around? And again, that's, this goes, I was just saying to what I was saying is like, yep. we have essentially do our work as far as the spiritual side of sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? If you want to do physical sovereignty, great, you know, start to, start, but start with the mind and the spirit of it, right? Reclaiming your, your contracts, reclaiming your, your, your relationship to yourself, doing your, your meditation and your prayer practice to recognize like what beliefs are driving me, right? What scarcity, what thoughts of scarcity and fears 
are driving me, my behaviors, my thoughts, right? My way of being. So, um, you know, I, I put out a couple of workshops. One is called the, um, the art of success. The other one is called the heart magic. Um, those are through my website. You can, you can get them. And it's like, we got to re approach how like the art of success, especially is about that, like reapproach how we see ourselves going back to what we were talking about, this game of hierarchy that we've been in, which, which is all part of the scarcity modality, right? Yep. Like mm-hmm. few people get to have that time on television. A few people get to have all the resources. Capitalism is bad because a few people have all the wealth. It's like, no, capitalism is great because it gives you the freedom to decide where to put your energy, your money, your investments, your time. But the problem is that we've had these, these scarcity modalities at work. And now we're entering a stage, an age of abundance. Because guess what? All those, that money you were talking about was all promissory notes anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not real money. Gold, silver, maybe that's real money, right? Real coin. But everything that people are walking around with their dollars, it's all promissory notes. Mm-hmm. Hey, when are you going to pay it? <laughs> when is it going to get paid back? <laughs> so that's why we're in this like this spiral of inflation, all this fakeness. But like, great, like let's ride that inflation. Let's let's be part of it. Let's be part of the abundance cycle right now, right? As, until yep. we do economy that will be more holistic. Like let's let's make the most of it. Let's profit from it. But first, it starts with knowing that I'm worth it because. As you just got, as you know from conscious wealth, it's like when you actually understand that you're worth it, and you shift your relationship to wealth from that modality of like I got to work hard. I'm not working hard enough. That's why I'm not earning anything. I don't deserve it. I I didn't do enough. Like whatever. I don't have the resources, the access. Man, people that don't have resources in this day and age, we got the internet. You got the whole library, you got more more books than ever ever in history available to you. So much wisdom. So many people out there talking. Speakers, teachers, leaders. Like, there's no excuse anymore. It's like this only the only excuse now is our own lack of curiosity, our own, our own desire to be in scarcity, our own desire to be in lack and our own and our and our, our fear of basically of stepping into our power. So that's what it is like this is my empowerment. And um, you know, really begins with kind of cleaning out, you know, what is in our archives, like what is in our archives, our belief systems that's that's limiting me. And that's why there is there's a lot of positives to like even what the you know, what the woke stuff's about, which is like you know, reappraising uh, Black history or Native American history. And I mean, I'm all for that. But don't go into victim consciousness because when you go into victim consciousness, you're done. As you know, like in life, if you're in victim consciousness, you're never satisfied. You're never going to have enough. You're just going to, you know, you're going to end up being the victimized the way BML victimized people by taking the money for a few people at the top, right? To make get paydays on. Because when you go into victim consciousness, you end up as a victim. Powerful words there. I, I like the I like the approach and we're very much in alignment there. The the number one thing I, I feel people can do starts with the them internally and the consciousness as well. And then everything comes outwards from that, right? So <clears throat> kind of a little bit of a pivot, but I'm just curious, out of all the different um things you've directed, the different documentaries you've done, different books you've written and all that, what has been your um what has been your most meaningful body of work to you? My most meaningful body of work is the body of work. You know, it's like, the thing is that I always explain to people, people ask me like, what's your favorite movie? And I go, what's your favorite moment in life? <laughs> <laughs> okay, touche. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, we can't, if we start taking apart, like, I like my arm better, but I like my right hand better than my left hand. I like my, my arm better than my leg. I mean, you start taking yourself apart. Okay. And it's like, we have to, we have to recognize the collective experience. So for me, like, you know, my body of work, it's to me, it's just an expression of my life story. Like everything yeah. that from, as I mentioned, Fight Against Time, which was my story about my father making Alexander and my relationship with him from mm. that, you know, first documentary all through my, you know, my documentaries, through my feature films, through my writing, uh, through my poetry book, you know, through my my courses that I, you know, I talk about workshops. It's like these are different expressions of who I am at that time. And this is why art is to me like so essential to the human experience. You know, everyone can express their art. You express your art, you know, through your talks, through your podcasts, through your work, you know, your courses, whatever it may be, right? Because we have to, we have to express, as they say, like, what is, what is left expressed, right? What, what is left unexpressed, what happens to it? It's just going to fester. It's, it's going to, it's going to, boy, it's going to ache. It's going to be, it's going to go into your heart and you're going to have a heavier heart. Whereas if you express it, you feel lighter, right? We all know that from a, from a good fight, from a good argument, from a good, whatever, you know, cry, right? We mm-hmm. express it. Man, it's no longer weighing on me. From your from your research and, and your perspective, is there one 
they or <laughs> are there a bunch of they's that are not necessarily cooperative with one another? So here we are with pronouns, huh? I don't yep, know what pronouns. <laughs> Is it a he, a him, a her, a she? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's aliens, man. <laughs> it's aliens it's them is us and us is them it's like i am at the i am at the place where the devil is god's best friend <laughs> and when we shift like at some levels of course like why you know do, do we have to stand like in our light and say like that's that's evil right that's that's manipulative that's dark you know Yes, we have to we have to stand, but we also have to recognize that that adversary is what creates us. That adversary is what builds us. It's like Conan the Barbarian when, you know, uh, what was his name? Uh, Thulsa was it Thulsa Doom was like the James Earl Jones character. He's like to those Conan. He's like, I created you because I killed your parents in front of you. I made you who you are. You know, this man that's like standing in front of me that's ripped and strong and like ready to fight and a warrior is because I traumatized you when you were a child mm. and then when you start to understand that that's what the dark side has been doing has been basically putting us through trauma they themselves are traumatized yep even the aliens that are doing it like the dark side of the alien experience let's say right they themselves are traumatized they're in scarcity or in reptilian brain of like fear and, and lack right so what is it doing it's all there to help us to wake up to become stronger to, to 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 work through our trauma because even you know going back to like conan i love that film it's like you know conan strikes down dulce doom and he just sits there and he's like what do i do now like, <laughs> dark and now what do i do you know <laughs> it's like we need it we need the we need something that some adversary in a sense even if it's not like as extreme as killing but like something to like work against or you know it's like friction right something to to challenge us you know and it's ultimately like i think we can find that in a more holistic way within ourselves and like within our aspirations with love as opposed to like fear right so it's like as opposed to like needing but for a long time of human history it's been about us prompting us into our sovereignty if we don't have the the mask mandates and the vaccine stuff like we don't get this movement of awakening of hey Wait a minute! I'm the human here. You don't tell me what to do. You're not. You're not my authority. You're not my nanny, my parent. I'm a. I'm a grown man and woman. I can decide for myself. So it's like each step along the way of the dark side. Is there a they? Yeah, there's many days, but it's ultimately it's like a collective experience that we need. Do you think that they's are cooperative? Do you think they compete with each other for their own interests? Well, there's a financial. I mean, like you can look at like Bill Gates, right? And I think he, I think he might be a Satanist or bloodline in some way, like some level of inbred, higher, higher like motivation than just okay. him. Like, I don't know if it's just like human being we're talking about here or like other forces that are working through him. But look at Bill Gates and how his wealth, his foundation network, is infiltrated so much of the health industries of the world, right? Whether it's WHO and Gavi Alliance, and then like the vaccine programs that they push globally on Africa and India, yep. and experiments they run, and then you know he's also like putting money, I think, into like this he even, and like obviously you know he's an advisor to like I mean why is he out there like you know telling people like what to do with COVID? I mean like you're running you know you're running simulations, you're you know you're partner with Fauci. I mean he's obviously got a huge influence because of his money, and um, you know buddies with Epstein and like why you know why is he courting Epstein for money that's nonsense Bill Gates is the richest guy in the world he needs Epstein's money come on please you know that's not true um so so you anyways you just take someone like that and you're like okay I can see the web of influence right but who's behind Gates like what are the forces like maybe I wouldn't say Buffett but like people like that he looks up to I mean I know yeah. he looks up, like but like people like that that like Who's behind that? That's what I'm always curious about because I know media doesn't tell you the truth and they don't tell you the full picture, right? So you're not going to know who the real, like, how do you say, not the real, but like who some of these like forces, figures, financial elements are. Yeah. It's, that's hard. That's there. That's the shadowy elements that the media. Yeah. We only see their spokespeople. We only see what they want us to see. The, the, the real people who 
who run shit we likely have never heard of and only we'll only hear of them if we want them to hear or if they want us to hear of them essentially yeah yeah or yeah you won't heard of them but you won't you won't connect it yep. you won't know right that, that actually was influencing that yeah yeah, I asked that because it's like it's something I think about a lot because so when you're in when you're in the the realms that me and you were in, you hear nonstop there's nonstop um I'll use the phrase conspiracy theories. There's nonstop theories for different people having um ulterior motives, right, in power. And some of them are more stronger cases than others. But what I see a lot of is people being very myopic in their views and just kind of going like good bad and they they kind of just go like oh they're all against us or whatever it may be right like if you're in if you're at all successful you sold your soul for example um or like if you're at all in power like you know there's a lot of conspiracies about that type of stuff so i'm always curious especially doing what i do and we get these types of questions a lot so i wanted i just wanted to hear your perspective around like my personal views on this is that there isn't a they, meaning there isn't just one they oppressing you. And, and I, was, I was being specific, I should have clarified because you went to like aliens and stuff that I was being specific to the 3D human realm game that we're playing because it's very easy to just go, oh, they're all against us, right? It's the government and it's the shadow government and it's the WEF and it's uh, Freemasons and it's X, Y, Z. And it's like from, and this took me a while to get to this stance because I thought that way for a long time. I thought it was all grouped together because it's easy to do that. It's easy to just kind of put it all in the same basket. But what I've come to find seems to point to, no, there are quite a few different they's, if you want to call them that, and they're competing to push their own interests to influence the way where society heads essentially it's a it's a um, we're all playing monopoly and those that have a lot of funds can play the game in a certain way to influence the next game we play and if you can influence the next game we play and you get to write some of those rules then you win so the next century or two you're going to be top of the top and so it only makes sense that if you if you're playing the monopoly game and you have a lot of the funds that you would probably do that and it would also make sense that if you're trying to do that let's take like klaus schwab and all them if you're the wef like that's one particular outcome that you're sh trying to influence the world towards but there are other ones too and i i think they're not necessarily cooperative like for example elon musk and bill gates do not like each other <laughs> <laughs> they don't like each other at all um our government doesn't like elon musk at all i'm a i'm a big um tesla investor and they do not back tesla at all they praise gm they praise uh rivian <laughs> they praise legacy auto who stands no chance in terms of innovation they don't, oh, they praise Ford. I mean, these companies that are so late to the party when it comes to EVs and innovation. And then you have Elon who they have over, they have billions of hours logged already in their dojo supercomputers of people's uh, self-driving footage, which is what their AI systems use to um, train itself, right? Like it's a feedback loop. So they record the hours driven, that recording then trains them to become even smarter and make less mistakes over time. They have that big of a head start, billions of hours. And our, and our government, like for example, Biden, will make like really like passive aggressive posts about like um, America's like, the the race to evs and like how we're a dominant force and they'll thank ford and gm and they won't mention tesla and it's a hilarious thing because when you're out on the road what is the number one car you see i mean it's like not even close and if you've ever driven in them so it's just like a funny thing where and i even have these conversations with my partner because she's big on like elon being a satanist and i'm just like i'm not really sure like it it, it, really? what it could be but Earth? look I said, where did she get that from, from his ex? No, like so the videos, like his mom, I guess, is, has done Illuminati stuff in, in magazines oh, and stuff like his, that. 
his mom his you know some people think he's manson charles manson's son his mom like went to like as a fangirl i think went to visit manson in prison you know that no i didn't know that yeah that was circulating i remember like late 2020 i think musk just between you and me musk is a mask yeah right it's gay it's a it's a mask and i think that um he has been he's been he's being utilized by the patriot faction this time. the patriot faction yeah that's what ah, i talked about okay the one throwing the republic mm-hmm. he kind of like the way that trump got picked up by like patriots yep. that are great i think musk had this because like you i had like i have a lot of suspicions around elon which is actually like an alien name it's l and on it's like literally two like ancient gods or I should say like two names for like lords, you know, in the ancient L yep. and all. Um, but I think that uh, uh, I think he's at this co- at this time has been picked up by the Patriot faction. So yeah. Yeah, that's why you always have to say like you have to like, you know, people shift. People get picked up at different times. They get activated yep. at different times. Right. And that's why you can't hold people like based on the past. Mm-hmm. It's really like just to know that, too. Like oftentimes people be like. Oh, so and so, you know, is Illuminati because they did this or that, and it's like, well, they may have, you don't know, like exactly what they may have done or had to do, but you know, they they also have the potential for redemption unless their soul is totally gone. And this is my my feeling is always like people have the ability to be redeemed, even 100%. Satan. Yeah, I mean, Satan was a fallen angel, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's an important conversation to have because as a community, like we're we're all learning. And we're all, it's not to say that we know and, and you guys don't, these are all just theories, right? We don't know either. But in my own journey, like I went, I spent years oversimplifying things and grouping things in buckets. And then the more I feel like it's like more, I would refer to it as like spiritual maturity, which is like, you have to give each situation its own, its own due diligence and not just group it in. Oh, it's another one of those. Just cause it's like, you see, you saw one thing about someone's mom being in the Illuminati or stuff like that. It's like. I look at people's actions and exactly like you're saying, maybe, you know, we've all made mistakes. Maybe, you know, people have done things or whatever it may be, been part of organizations or had questionable um, relationships or whatever it may have been that were photographed. And then you can paint a narrative. But when you look at someone's actions, that's a pretty good indication, unless they're playing super high level chess, a pretty good indication of, you know, where their, where their heart lies. So just wanted to ask you about that. Um, as we start to kind of wrap up, I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about the, about the future. So where do you see us in 2030? Mm. This is a powerful decade, obviously. And 2030 specifically has some, carries some weight. So where do you see us? I see this, 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 this drama playing out throughout this decade. Um, at the same time, I feel like the light is prevailing. So it's just it's really it's just it's just a matter of how quickly people come into the light but um it's just light rising basically from here so whatever when the light rises what that means when darkness does things it becomes exposed more rapidly and human consciousness basically is is transforming so when human consciousness is transforming the way it is you can't really account for those moments of revelation and those moments of just total transformation, you can, you know, singularity moments, essentially, you can't know it. So I think that we're, it's really upon us. Like the AI is going to be very important in this, you know, in these coming years. Um, I look at AI as both dark and light. It's been around probably since the beginning of the universe. <laughs> it's ancient. And it's going to be an important tool for, um, I think, for transparency and for, for aiding us, essentially. Like we, we really are at any moment now, if, if our consciousness is ready, like I was just watching the the last uh, the lost century, the Greer documentary, right? And like all this stuff, you know, we know this. Like those of us that have looked at this and studied, we know the technology is there for what's called like over unity, right? Where basically it's it's almost like free energy, but basically where you produce more energy than you put in, and and in a way that's that's like magnified, you know, so that you could run cities on, you know, just the the quantum the quantum realm of energy. Right, you could run cities, you could run machinery, you name it. And when you do that, if you actually transform the, how how energy is created and distributed, you you know you'd have a much more a much a much more profitable way of being in the world without needing to be so stressed, right? By uh, you know your name your 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 in cost inputs of you name it anything running a machinery running overhead right all that kind of stuff. Um, so 
we are on the cusp of that. But I think the human consciousness has, again, been in scarcity modality and been uh, been manipulated at some level into that scarcity modality. So it's that's what's preventing us from actually taking hold. So when I see things like the disclosure on UFOs and the technology, I'm like, this is a great sign because it means that now in the in the in the consciousness we're ready to receive this idea. Because if there's alien craft and alien technology, then what are we doing with it? <laughs> Why aren't we deploying it? Right. So that's the next step. So this this decade really, it's it's it it, it could play out in so many different ways. But overall, I see a more holistic economy. Um, you know, the affiliate programs like are a great example of like where I think a lot of the economy is going, a lot of business is moving in that direction where we can all profit from, you know, from from you name it, from product. Um from, from from any company. I mean, the problem with like these old modalities like Facebook and Instagram, like they're valued at billions of dollars, but their value is based on us. And that's the old modality. The future modality is going to be, hey, you're valued at, Facebook's valued at billions of dollars. Guess what? You're posting, you're using it. You're getting, you're getting money from that. You're getting, uh, you know, some kind of cryptocurrency from that. You know, the transparency of where the wealth is going. The fact that we have this ability now with the blockchains and others to see where the, where the money's moving and stuff, it's going to make everyone more accountable. So that's the future. I don't think it's about them surveilling and controlling us. I think it's, no, it's actually us surveilling and controlling anyone who tries to be in power. Now you're going to be held accountable. We, the people are in charge. That's where it's moving. It's going to take time, but that's where it's going. Beautiful. So you're a fan of um, crypto, the blockchain and all of that? Yeah. I mean, as a principle, you know, again, there's flawed cryptos and everything. Right, right. That, the technology. Yeah. What's the difference between crypto and a dollar? I mean, a freaking dollar is just a promissory note. <laughs> yeah. Well, it can't be can't be worse than a fiat system. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm just clarifying. Yeah, that's, you know, you bring up an important thing, which is that word transparency, which is a, a cornerstone of the value proposition of cryptocurrency, right? Is knowing, having transparency of knowing what things are going where, and it's going to make things awfully hard to be manipulated the way that they can right now. Or, you know, money can just be created digitally, it can be sent, things can be fudged, it can be hidden, etc. So, yeah, it's an exciting decade, man. I'm always thinking about, um, well, first off, I like to ask every guest that about 2030. Some people are more optimistic, some people are more pessimistic. I'm definitely uh, more in the optimistic, but not a naive optimist, quite the opposite. I doing constant research around these types of things and um, kind of have built a brand around solutions to these types of things. And so knowing everything that I know and that you know, we're still both optimistic about 2030. And hopefully that's eye opening for those of you who are, you know, maybe newer to this stuff or uh, maybe in that season where it's overwhelming, right? And it seems like, oh, the world's ending. It's like, as I always say, zoom out, <laughs> take some space. Like this has happened many times before. Humanity goes in cycles. Uh, the world is not ending. We don't need to be chicken littles. <laughs> so as we um, as we wrap things up, any any final thoughts, anything you wanted to um, touch on or anything on your heart that you want to make sure um, you convey to the audience? Um, you know, honestly, I think I got it all across. And uh, again, it's it really is. It is. Uh, it is about consciousness. Right. It is about attitude and how we approach our reality. So I look at it like we've been so past oriented as humans. Right. That's how most people think and believe it's. Well, it didn't happen yesterday. It didn't happen last year. Or this is what happened before. So it's going to happen again. Like, that's not how reality works. If you think that you're going to extrapolate from the past and project it onto the future, you are going to end up in a very off direction. You have to literally just recognize that the universe is constantly creating. It's a creative universe. So it wants things to be different. It doesn't want things to be the same. It wants things to change. There might be certain patterns that we can recognize, but if we can take the energy of, of our imagination, our experience of creativity to bring it forward, we can create the realities that we want. We just have to trust that we are moving in that direction. Do you think there's something inside of humans that requires us to kind of play out the drama of what we see in a movie? <laughs> well, yeah, because we create humans create the movies. I know. <laughs> 
earlier when you were talking about, you know, when I was asking you about they and you went into like Conan the Barbarian and how it's like, but you made me. And it's that aspect of like, we spend so much time like fearing the dark and like uh, trying to get out ahead of it and worrying about it and ostracizing it and really giving it a lot of a, a lot of this attention and and almost like wishing it would go away right it's like people try to kill their ego and you come into sovereignty and you try to kill your straw man and in my opinion these are all the same thing it's like we're trying to kill the very thing that makes us it's and it's the same story in, in the bible where lucifer was a fallen angel it's it's god's shadow it's it's the same thing we're talking about you can't have one without the other and so when mm. i look at cinema it's like in many ways it seems like we there's something to that we, we're just like living out this infinite repeating thing of good and evil where evil just has to act out its trauma on good and good just fails to realize that evil isn't what it seems like evil is yes. like you can't have one without the other like this is just god realizing itself right that's right I think that's a good, uh, <laughs> we, are, we are, we are not like, we are, we are the oneness. We are part of the oneness that is God. We're not disconnected from it. So even the dark connected to it and, um, it's God knowing itself through this experience. I mean, what better way to know yourself than to, you know, set yourself off on like a journey far from home without, you know, basically like born naked and alone and not alone, but like naked and like in trust, right? You don't have angels or guides, you know, they're there telling you which way to go. You have parents that are just as flawed, just as human, right? Trying to figure it out. This is how God is learning itself through us, through our experience of separation. You know, we're also fallen in that sense, but it's okay. We're still, the universe has still got us. It's still, you know, we're not alone. It just sometimes feels that way. I think that's a beautiful place for us to end off on. Can you let the audience know where they can uh, connect with you, connect with your work, et cetera? And then we'll, of course, put everything below in the show notes. Yeah, totally. Just I think seanstone.info on the website is the best place that they can find my work, you know, uh, connect with me, email me. Cool, seanstone.info. And um, we'll also have that up on the screen for you guys so you can check that out and below in the description. Highly recommend you guys check out uh, some of Sean's, both his... Um, cinematic work as well as the books that he's written and some of the interviews that he's done if you guys appreciate my stuff you will definitely appreciate his stuff so mr sean appreciate you being here today thank you for having a conversation i really enjoyed it and everyone listening we hope you got value out of this guys see you next time